Hello and welcome to Florilegia. This is a small pot of fake in which I, Danny, share with whoever wants to listen the fanfics that I really, really like. Today I am going to read Ezra's Birdie's Possession. I really hope you like it. I don't want it, he had said, over and over again to anyone who will listen. But no one will take it. By rights, it had to be won, and no one will step to the challenge of taking him down, especially not after the rumors. By his side, since the day he pulled it from Muff Kittens and years before that, you had accepted your life will be difficult. Expected it, even. I'm not going anywhere, Dean. You had told him as he had tried his hardest to tell you he understood if you left him, as he begged you to leave him. To go be somewhere safe. It was like he knew. You will never, ever tell him you wished you would have killed him the moment he touched the fucking thing. This new power had not so much corrupted him as enhanced him. All of his worst tendencies, his stubbornness, his inability to communicate, his anger increased. Sometimes you will see a flash of his former self and send thanks to the maker that he was still in there, somewhere. But it vanished as quick as it came. He had needed a queen. You had never talked about it, it was just assumed. And you wanted it less than he had wanted the damn saber. You had no ties to anyone, mostly feral when Dean found you, just surviving. It had taken time for you to trust him and he to trust you. Being the Mandalore's queen did not suit you, but the Mandalore did, or had, once, and so you endured. You should have saved him. You could have saved him. His eyes were the first thing to change. The first time you saw his brown eyes was on Moff Gideon's light cruiser. Moments after the Jedi took Grogu away to safety. You thought of that little green baby as both of yours. He had turned around without putting his helmet back on, and you had thrown your hands over your eyes and looked away like his features would burn you. You had spent years trying to memorize them in the dark, but never thought you would see them. This was the way, and you respected the creed. It wasn't until he wrapped his hands around your wrists and forced them away from your face that you opened your eyes and took him in. And he was so beautiful. His brown eyes held suffering and loss, but he looked so happy to see you that you wrapped your arms around him and cried into his shoulder. And he held you until you finished, whispering soothing words into your ear. In the weeks after the retaking of Mandalore, you saw his brown eyes growing darker. The thought the unfamiliar setting of a palace was to blame. It was large and drafty and lights flickered. Everything was enormous and metal and stone, not at all like the home you had made on the crest. Your wedding night was when you realized that something was wrong. When he was still mostly thin. In the hazy afterglow of lovemaking, your emotions got the better of you, and you mentioned Grogu. It was nothing, an enough-hand comment about missing him. You had said similar things before, and so had Dean. But he stiffened and rolled over to look at your smiling face with an expression you had never seen before. Dean was slow to anger, but you'd seen him angry before. This was not anger. This was wrath. For the first time you feared him, something had crawl from the darkness and drape the terrible veil over his face, his usually kind features contorted into a snarl and the whites of his eyes had turned black. They almost looked like Grogu's but held none of the innocence and wonder. Don't, he had growled, in soft echoes of voices that did not belong accompanying his own. You had swallowed, fighting off the fear and the confusion and the pain. I'm sorry. You had said in a small voice, is it nothing still only held your gaze for a moment more? Dean, you asked when he didn't move. You were afraid to touch him. 
the veil moved back at the mention of his name and his face dropped as he looked around confused. His eyes were normal again. What? He asked when he saw the horror-stricken look on your face. Waiter? He reached for your face and you flinched away from him for the first time. You were not a crier, yet tears streamed down your face. Panic-stricken, his eyes full of tears and confusion, he had begged you to tell him what had happened. I don't remember, he had said while you sobbed into his arms. I don't remember, I'm sorry, what did I do? You should have knocked the thing away as soon as he touched it. Dean Jarin exists in a body that eats and drinks and breathes. He is, for all the galaxy to see, a regular man. He carries the saber in a holster on his hip where his pistol used to be. Golden armor has replaced the shining silver, pristine when the armor I presented to him. A sticky black substance now snakes up the sides of his grips. The servants clean it until their shoulders are sore, but the substance remains. He didn't notice this. He does not complain. Soiled armor is the least of his worries. He cocked his head, as though listening to someone speak. Sometimes he murmurs an agreement and holds the dark saber tighter in his hand. What is it, my love? you ask. He looks at you curiously. What did you hear? he asks, and his voice is lower and many. The echoes are long and fierce and angry. You have not dared to ask what they are and you do not think he will answer if you did. Nothing, you say. The fear inside of you is no longer of him, but for him. You should be more afraid, you think, but it's not your mind being toyed with. You approach him with caution, and when he sees your advance, he grips the dark saber so tightly his knuckles turn white. No. He growls, but not to you. You swallow and bite your tongue. The question of who or what he is talking to dies in your throat, and instead you lie a hand on his shoulder. You seem upset, waiter, you say. He is silent for a moment, and when he meets your gaze, you see him. There are too many, he mumbles. You run your fingers through his curly hair, and for a moment everything feels like it once had. You close your eyes and savor the moment. When you open them again, he's gone. His brown eyes are black again. Dean used to smell like musk and soap and cedar and oil. And now, there is only the sweet scent of rotten food that follows him wherever he goes. You should have cut his godforsaken hand off. There is no demand for an heir, but he fucks you like there is. It is the only time you feel close to the man that you know is still in there, somewhere. Even after all of this, you cling to him. You ache for him. You wish for him. You wish for Dean. Not this tragic, horrifying echo of what he was. The only way you can find your way to him and steal your broken, bloodied heart is when he is inside of you. Every time he is harder and meaner than the last. Look at me, pretty girl, he says. And for once, the voice that comes out of is only his own. Splayed out in front of him, legs open, pliant, needy, begging mouth, your cunt drapes for him whoever he is, and he refuses his cock for hours. You think he likes this, this torture he puts you through. You open your eyes at his order, searching for him. You find him in his brown eyes. Are you okay? he asks. For a moment, he's there, concerned for you, worried that he might have hurt you. His gaze trials down the bruises and marks he has left on your body over the last few hours with harsh ministrations and bites and slaps. You don't bother answering because you know he will be gone in an instant. Glimpses of his former self are less and less. You blink back the tears. 
He grips the dark saber held in his hand and holds it over you, eyes and inky void once more. Do you want this? He asks. He echoes only a whisper, and you nod vigorously. Open, he grunts, and you spread your legs. So wet, my little whore, you love this. You whimper in affirmation. The weakness in your voice matches the fragility of your body, and he pushes the hilt of the dark saber inside of you. He has teased you and teased you and teased you all night. You comfort yourself with the delusion that he prolongs this because the thing you once knew is inside, forcing a connection. You do not know what makes it vibrate like this, and it terrified you to ask. It fills your cunt with a decadent sensation that pulls profane moans from your throat and his as he watches you right underneath him. The vibrations of the hilt spread from your cunt to the pit of your belly, to the tips of your fingers and toes. There is no softness left in him, and he pushes and pulls until your sleek has doused the weapon. He smears at you whining and wiggling and swats your bare, bruised hip. Stay still. He commands. Let me know, he growls. You'll come when we say you can. He glares with a dreadful smile. The ghost of the green that you had only just learned before this took hold. Okay, you purr. You're ours, Meshla, he asks, and his gentleness confuses you. His black eyes are wide with curiosity as he removes the heel from your cunt and you whimper. Always, you murmur. Who else would I be? No one's. He says through greed the tea as he slides his leaking thick cock into you. He steadies himself and sets a brutal, furious pace but presses his lips to yours. His lips are cloyingly sweet. Smeared with the black substance that drips into your mouth. Only mine, says Dean's anguished voice. The cacophony swallows it up before you can be sure it was real. The sticky black substance you first found climbing up Dean's armor is everywhere. It creeps through the palace like the veins of a massive ancient organism. It claims every stone and metal surface it reaches like a plague, the servants cordon of the infected rooms. It even claims you. It grows up the hand you hold to his face in those precious moments that he kisses your lips while he rams that cold metal hilt or his own cock into you. It bleeds through the glow you wear to hide it. It will not be ignored. Your thoughts are muddled and dark. You are quick to anger, exhausted, existing, sitting in one throne room next to a man who is a shell of his former self, a man who once ran to care for you if you so much as skinned your knee now fucks you until you're bleeding. You thank him for it as his cruel smile leers over you. You should have killed him. He should be dead. Dean rarely sleeps, but he keeps up the appearance of doing so. You wake up often and find him staring up at the ceiling. Sometimes he whispers to himself. Sometimes you wake to him asleep and wrapped around you like before, and you forget that you aren't back in the crest, safe and warm and content. Dean's appetites have become insatiable. An advisor discreetly implied that perhaps the Mandalore will prefer that other volunteers be brought in to help. Your reader held him by the throat until the man died. Black blood dripped from Dean's ears as he heft with rage. No one suggested it again. Strange, winding dreams plague what little sleep you achieve. Something in them begs to speak with you and murmurs to you when you're awake. You ignore it. It can't have you too. A dull ache in your belly wakes you this night, like so many nights before. The palace is dark enough during the day, but at night there are no silvers of sunlight to guide you. Dean is not in bed. 
whispers drip from the throne room. Stumbling into the large open hall, you see your beloved slumped on the throne, his chin resting on his fist in thought. Raider? you ask, his head cocked at a strange angle that makes your aching stomach churn, snaps up. Why are you awake? he asks. They ask. Why are you? you challenge. Though you know better. He stands and ambles to you, the sticky black substance trailing behind him. He is so much larger than you, somehow even taller than before. You glare up at him with your arms folded. Why do you test us, Meshla? The voices ask. Your eyes start to the dark saber in his hand. He presses a button and the dark black laser shoots from the hilt that's been inside of you so many times. The slick gathering between your legs is an almost automatic response. If you wanted me dead, you would have done it already, you tell him. There's a tickle in the back of your mind as the thing from your nightmares begs for entrance, then chuckles and you wince at the noise, like a thousand knives scraping metal. We never wanted you dead, he says. The cacophony is darker and louder still. Only with us. Will you kill me if I try to leave, Raider? You ask. Yes, the darkness says. The room settles in the truth that you've known for so long. His black eyes glitter in the dim moonlight. Is he in there? You ask. Just as much as we are. It says, and you can hear Dean's rasp too. A tear slides down your cheek and his sticky hand reaches to wipe it away. He switches the saber off and turns abruptly back to the throne. Come here, the cacophony commands as he sits. He pats his meaty tide and you drape yourself on his lap. Let us show you what you can have if you let go, Meshla. Dean shoves his armor thigh between your legs. The cold metal finds your moon. He presses against your pussy and a gasp escapes your lips. You cannot control yourself or the way your body reacts. You could never resist him, not in your old life and certainly in this new, twisted mockery of it. He does it again and again, holding your hips steady as you roll against him. Good girl, the cacophony says, and they all sound like Dean. Sweet girl, you've been by us this whole time. Let us give you something. Will it hurt? You ask, rubbing your core against him like an animal. Yes, it says, but not for long. He pulls his cock out, glistening with pre and pumps himself a few times. The cacophony groaning as he does. Dean removes your struggling form from his side and places you on his cock with an unnatural ease. As you sink down, you whine at his thickness. He gives you no time to get used to the fullness. Move, it says. The command has you writhing back and forth, your slick pussy bouncing up and down on him with his fingers digging so far into your flesh you think he might pierce it. Dean, you whine. Dean, it whines back at you. It mocks every sound you make with a distorted version of the noises that leave your body. Wave after wave of arousal accompanies the cruelty. It might have bothered you once, your vulnerability being ridiculed, but you need it now. A coiled spring burns inside you, and his cock spurs you as his hips lift lazily. You wrap your arms around his neck and he bites you until his teeth rip through your skin. Crying out, you wrap your legs around him too. Look at us, it commands. You move your head back, open your eyes and see glassy brown staring back at you. The sweet, cloying scent of rot leaves the air, replaced by cedar and musk and soap. Meshla, he calls. Only Dean's voice speaks now. Dean, is it you? It's me, 
he groans, pushing into you. Feels so good, Mejla. I'm sorry I let them. I'm sorry. You feel so fucking good. I need, I want, I can feel you. I can feel you like this. Can you, can you always when they, yes, makes me feel so good, feel so real, he murmurs into your mouth. I miss you so much, you say. I'm here. He fucks into you, hard, grabbing every part of you he can, licking into your mouth and over your lips, kissing your cheeks and eyes and forehead, trying to memorize you like you memorized him all those nights on the crest. Let me in, he says. Let me in. I love you. But he blinks and his brown eyes are black. The cock inside of you is more vicious now. But it caresses a spot inside of you that has you screaming Dean's name. Your throaty grunts echoing throughout the high ceiling hall. A shift in movement and your eyes wrench open. An otherworldly glow oozes from the man in front of you and you are suddenly hovering in the air. He holds your legs up around him to secure you with supernatural strength as you bounce over his throbbing cock. He hits inside of you at an angle that should hurt, but your legs shake with violent and unnatural pleasure. Invisible fingers glide over your clit and you cry out. What is that? You breathe, shaking. Us, it says. It pulls orgasm after orgasm from you like this until you sob, but the fingers continue their services. Thin cock drips with your uses and you have nothing more to give. Please. You beg, please, I can't, you will, it says. The glow stops as he glides gently to the floor and lays you down. Crawling between your legs, he places a black tongue between your legs and devours your abused pussy. He slams four fingers inside of you and curls them until he finds your G-spot. It comes from nowhere and showers him while he watches your hips buck into the air and you scream until your throat burns. You grind your pussy into his mouth while he licks up everything he can. Good girl, sweet girl. You've done so well for us, it growls. Please, then please, I need you, I need you, you beg. And the man crawls up to your face and licks a long stripe from the base of your neck to your ear. He stops his cock into you and you wince from the sensitivity. Tell us again. It says, thrusting in and out. I need you. I need this. I never, never want to leave you. Never want to be without you, you babble. Not sure what it wants, only knowing that's what you want. Hours, it growls. Hours. And he comes and comes until you feel it leak onto the floor. And he shudders against your neck, still bleeding from where he beat you earlier. Reader, it says. The hideously sweet smell of rot returns, and you breathe it in hungrily. The black substance crawls angrily up your arms. What is it? You whisper. Us. It purrs. As you watch the substance crawl up your body, your vision darkens. You wish you had ripped him limb by limb.